Okay, <clears throat> time to see how it is we can expand what Neuron comes out of the box with. When you install Neuron, what you get by default is a limited palette of mechanisms. You get, in terms of density mechanisms, you have pass, which is simply a linear leak channel like that is a density mechanism. You can put it anywhere. You can, you have um, Hodgkin Huxley, which gives you the Hodgkin Huxley sodium and potassium channels and the Hodgkin Huxley's leak uh, current. Uh, and that's uh, sort of basically it. So what if you want to have some calcium channels or some other sodium or potassium channels that are different? Well, you have to add those to Neuron. And one way to do that is with N model. You can also do it with a channel builder, but let's talk about N model because you're going to see lots of N model code generated by various people, including in, in uh, model DB, which Robert will be telling you about soon. So the model description language um, actually is not the same as Hoke or Python. It has its own strange looking syntax. It is specialized for the purpose of making new density mechanisms and new point processes. And the density mechanisms can include ion accumulation. The point processes can include electrodes and synapses. And you can also add artificial spiking cells with N model. In, and, and I will get to that in a later talk. <clears throat> and as I said earlier, the kinetics of these things can be governed by differential equations that you specify or kinetic schemes or algebraic equations if they are you know, uh, analytical in form. So for example, you can make a current source that has a sinusoidal that generates a sinusoidal current with user specifiable frequency and amplitude, okay, and, and mean value. All right, it's already been done. What are the advantages of N model? Well, for one thing, Neuron has many different integrators that it can use depending on the uh, kind of equations that your model uses. And uh, if you had to write your own code in MATLAB or Python or C, uh, you'd have to write a separate different integrator to deal with each of these uh, different, um, um, you'd have to write different code for each of those different integrators, depending on what kind of channel mechanism uh, or, or point process you wanted to add it. Well, with NModel, you can just write, so you can just focus on the mechanism itself and not worry about the integrator because the translation that Neuron does automatically generates code that's appropriate for each of Neuron's built-in in, uh, integrators. Another nice thing about it is that a single N model statement is translated into many C statements. Well, I'm changing that, that's C++ statements, okay? It's translated into C++, or at least it should be. And the interface code for the graphical interface is automatically generated. And if it's a, a mechanism that generates ionic currents, the interface code for telling other things about the ionic flux through this thing is already there. Uh, if it depends on reversal potentials of, of particular ions, uh, the interface code is there to discover those reversal potentials. And you don't have to write any of that, okay? Also, well, units are consistent and all that. Well, you, you don't appreciate that until you actually get into writing the code. So N model doesn't look like any programming language you've seen. Um, instead, it's structured into blocks. The most important block when you're first starting to use uh, a mechanism specified with N model is the neuron block, because it's the neuron block that contains statements that tell you what is the name of this thing. If it's a suffix name, that tells you it's a density or distributed channel. If it says point process, obviously it's a point process. If it's an artificial spiking cell, it'll say artificial cell, okay? If it uses information pertinent to particular ions, you'll have use ion statements. So we'll know that this K-chan thing actually 
needs to know the value of reversal potential for potassium, and it generates a, a current which is attributable to potassium. So it effectively generates like an ion flux of potassium. And if it has parameters, you'll see what these parameters are. And are they range variables or are they global? Well, like G bar here is a range variable, which means that this K chan can have a different G bar in every compartment into which it's been inserted. So you have a section that has one compartment. It'll only need one value of G bar. If you have a section that has 99 compartments, each of those 99 compartments can have its own value of G bar. They might be the same value initially, but you can go through with code, iterate over those sections, those segments, and change it to whatever you want. Okay. There's a units block. There's a parameters block, the significance of which is pretty obvious. You're assigning values to uh, parameter names, named parameters. There's a states block. These are the variables that are being solved for in the end model mechanism. And there's an assigned block is where you typically do things like, well, if you're assigning a value to a potassium current, you'll have an assigned statement and you'll define the name of the variable that is uh, getting a value assigned to it. Okay, and there needs to be an initial block usually, uh, you know, I think always, uh, which says, what are the states going to be at t equals zero when you initialize this thing? Okay, there will be, if you're, <clears throat> if you're calculating currents um, as a function of memory potential or time, uh, or if you're calculating uh, states or whatever, There'll probably be a break, there will be a breakpoint block. It may contain a solve statement and maybe a solved deriv and uh, method CNEXP. Um, um, there will be a maybe an assignment statement that assigns a value to a current that's being generated. There'll be state equations. Oh, there could be a kinetic block if you're dealing with something that's described by kinetic schemes. So like a Markov scheme model of an ion channel gating, okay? So it'd be um, a different looking breakpoint block in that circumstance. Okay, there's equations. So here we have a derivative block that whose purpose is to define an ODE, ordinary differential equation, that gets solved numerically. And you can have functions and procedures, procedures that return values that take arguments. All right. So if you've installed <clears throat> Neuron, you will have an N model on your machine. And how do you deal with it? Well, you, if you get statements in it, you have to compile them in order for them to be loaded into Neuron. OK? And the way you compile them depends on which operating system that you're using. And if it's. Um, if it's Unix um, or Linux or OS, uh, Mac uh, OS, whatever they're calling it these days, I didn't check this week. Um, the command is going to be NRN IV model. In the future, that name may change when we uh, finish revising the heck out of N model. Uh, with Windows, uh, you can operate from the command line and compile mechanisms, or you can use this um, icon-based tool to double click on this and la launch a compiler that then allows you to navigate to where your end model files are and compile them. And once you've compiled mod files and you start Neuron and it finds the library of compiled files, <clears throat> automatically your new mechanisms become available, okay? So Neuron, Neuron comes out of the blocks with pass and HH. And if we now define, we have n-model files that define two different mechanisms called HHK and KD, and we compile those. Neuron can load that code, that library of compiled stuff, and automatically those compiled, excuse me, automatically those compiled mechanisms are integrated into Neuron and are accessible through the command line and through all of the graphical tools that need to know the names of density mechanisms or point processes.
So in this case, these are density mechanisms. If we had a point process whose mod file we compiled, it would appear in the list of point processes in all graphical tools that manage point processes. OK, let's take a look at some code. Here's a, the end model code for a density mechanism called leak. It is a nonspecific current. We know it's a density mechanism because its name is, this declaration here is with this suffix statement. It generates a nonspecific current called I. A nonspecific current is not attributable to any of the existing ions. So this is just like, we don't care about the fact that there's this flux of whatever it is across the membrane, except that it generates charge that must be taken into account in our charge balance equations. Okay, that's what nonspecific current does. Declares a variable that isn't going to affect sodium or potassium or chloride or anything else. Okay, our leak mechanism has a G parameter, a conductance parameter, a reversal potential parameter, and it returns a value of current. And all of these are range variables, which means that each of these variables can have a different value in every segment of every section into which you inserted leak. The parameter block declares the default value for G in Siemens per square centimeters. And for its reversal potential, the assigned block declares that you're going to be assigning values to I and its units are milliamps per square centimeter which is appropriate for a density mechanism, okay? It's a current density that it generates, and V, which is membrane potential in millivolts. And the breakpoint block is where we calculate the value of the current generated by this mechanism as the product of its conductance density times the driving force, which is local membrane potential minus local reversal potential. So there's the end model code for a density mechanism called leak. What if we had a point process that was a linear conductance, but acted as a localized linear conductance that has very restricted spatial extent? So we can treat it as a point source of current. Well, we would have declared it as a point process, and I'm going to call it shunt, and I'm going to capitalize the word shunt because it's now a class name. It's going to be a class name. It generates a nonspecific current I, and it has range variables I, E, and R. The current that it generates is I, its reversal potential is E, and R is the magnitude of the shunt in ohms, or in this case, gig ohms. Okay? So we talk about a gig ohm seal when we're making a patch clamp attachment to a cell. So our resistors, our resistor for our, our shunt hole, like we poked a hole in the cell, it has a particular leak, we're gonna specify it with this parameter R, okay? And it has a default value of one gig ohm, and our reversal potential for this leak is gonna be zero millivolts. So this really is like a leak. Ripped the hole in the cell, cell's membrane. There's assigned variables, I and V, and the breakpoint block calculates the value of I as the product of the, excuse me, the product of a scale factor times the driving force divided by the resistance. We need the scale factor because otherwise this ratio would be a thousand times too large numerically. Okay. All right, what do these look like in terms of user interface? In the user, in the graphical user interface, leak. Our density mechanism would appear in all in all GY tools that manage density mechanisms. And our point process shunt would appear in all tools that manage point processes, for example, the point process manager. And our usage is here. I'm going to concentrate on the Python usage. Python usage of our leak, well, we would do SOMA insert leak. And then SOMA, we'd specify the name of leak. And then we would make an assignment statement. And then we can print the value of 
that current, okay? Soma 0.5 is a particular segment in the soma, and it's the leak mechanism attached to that, uh, which, which is inserted into that part of the soma, and it's the current through that, okay? A shunt, on the other hand, is, a, is an instance of a class. So we create a new instance of the shunt class, and we tell Python where it's attached to. It's attached to the segment that corresponds to the midpoint of the soma. Okay, and that's what this statement does. And it returns an object that this Python alias refers to. We can now find out what the series resistance for our shunt is. We're going to assign it a value of two gigohms. And then if we wanted to print the current that it that flows through it, that print statement would do it. Okay. So we see the two different ways of dealing with these things depending on whether density mechanisms or whether they're point processes. Okay. I'm going to quickly go over this. This is an example of how N model makes it easy to do things. Imagine we have a model that has an ion channel, okay, with potassium that can leak out of the cell, all right? And under normal circumstances, potassium might accumulate adjacent to the extracellular membrane. But if we ignore that ion accumulation and we subject this cell to a depolarizing current step, reversal potential, the concentration of extracellular potassium remains unchanged because we're ignoring the ion accumulation. We're not keeping track of it. And the reversal potential for, so, for the, for the uh, potassium also doesn't change. And as a result, we get this trajectory for the current through that potassium channel. Okay, so there's our potassium channel, a density mechanism that generates a voltage-gated potassium current, okay? But what if we insert an ion accumulation mechanism into the same section? Our ion accumulation, uh, accumulation mechanism will read IK to discover what other mechanisms, what mechanisms are attached to this segment that are writing IK. Every mechanism that writes IK contributes to the mass balance equation for potassium. And Neuron allows you to discover what is the net value of all of those potassium fluxes in that segment. And we can write KO. KO is what? KO is the extracellular potassium concentration. So how does it do that? It solves this equation, which is the first order charge balance equation, mass balance equation, which converts, uses the Faraday constant and the thickness of the space in which potassium is accumulating to calculate a flux of potassium into this small compartment and also calculates the equilibration between this com small compartment and the external bath. This is the standard um, uh, Frankenheiser um, uh, Hodgkin space. Okay. And if we do have that ion accumulation mechanism inserted into our model, what will happen is that during the response to the depolarizing current, uh, depolarizing command, potassium will accumulate in the extracellular space and we will see EK change. We will see potassium accumulate, the concentration will increase. And EK is changing automatically. Neuron will recalculate EK automatically for you because it knows that the potassium concentration is changing. And the potassium current will also change because the driving force is getting less. Okay. All right. So you didn't have to take care of all that stuff in the background. All you had to do is focus on the properties of the ion channel and how it is that ion accumulation works. And neuron takes care of all the rest. OK. N model can be used for other, far more complicated things. I'm going to skip over this. This is a, a model of calcium triggered cal uh, transmitter release described by a set of kinetic scheme transitions. 
Uh, units checking, I'm going to skip over. OK. And uh, that's the end of that presentation. Are there questions at this point? OK. Are there, is there more than that? OK, I think we're ready now for Robert. All right, you should see my screen. Is that correct? We do see it. Excellent. All right, so in this session, I want to talk to you about, so we've, we've seen a lot of stuff about you know, this is how we build models. Uh, we have, we can do some stuff with the GUI. We can, um, we can specify these things uh, with mod files, but that seems like a lot of work and it is, but we can uh, avoid repeating ourselves and repeating things that have already been done by taking advantage of resources that exist out there um, that have uh, sort of sh for model sharing. Uh, and in particular, right now, I wanna highlight two resources uh, first of all, ModelDB, uh, which is a discovery tool for computational neuroscience models, and neuromorpho.org for uh, neuron morphologies. So, uh, so like I said, ModelDB is a discovery tool and repository for computational neuroscience models. Um, you don't have to write mod files from scratch. You can go to ModelDB and you'll find literally thousands of them as part of published models that you can reuse or modify. You can go there to look for code examples. You can go there to try and figure out how somebody built a model. So many options, just having everything in one place. Uh, what do we have? Uh, there are, as of the other day, 789 neuron models. Um, that's out of a total collection of 1,746 uh, models. These are all published, these are all models that have published source codes that are uh, published papers that are available. Um, they are not just neuron models, obviously, because 789 is not equal to 1746. Um, and in total, you'll find stuff there from 105 different simulators or programming languages. Um, and it's useful to look at these, even if you're working in Neuron to be able to see, well, okay, well, what kinds of parameters or how do they structure their data? Even if, you, even if they're not using the tools that you're most familiar with, you can still learn from looking at how other people approach the problem. Uh, there's models for approximately 200 different cell types uh, spanning across 21 uh, or more different species, uh, 62 ion channels, pumps, et cetera, types of ion channels and pumps. Uh, these cover a wide range of topics ranging from uh, sort of the clinically focused, so like what about Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, to the more basic science questions like how does spike timing dependent plasticity work. Um, and the reason that we need to do this is because it's just generally not possible to describe everything within uh, a paper. There's a lot of complexity to these models. Um, you know, just imagine the morphology and describing all the details of the morphology. Well, there's a lot of complexity to this. Um, and in practice, what we found is that basically a third of model publications, so a third of the uh, model entries in ModelDB have tw 20 or more files that, are, uh, that collectively describe the model. Um, about a quarter of the files are over five kilobytes in size. And you, again, you just cannot do this and you cannot capture everything in a paper. And even if you try to do this, then there's always a possibility that bugs and typos, errors and omissions might um, distort uh, the dynamics. And sorry, I apologize. Um, Hey, Evan, can you help him with that? Hey, how's it going? Sorry, I apologize. Um, uh, so anyways, uh, so there's a lot of complexity. And if you try to reproduce things on your own, or if somebody's, uh, it's possible that when somebody describes things that they do describe, that there could be errors that are introduced, typos uh, in the typesetting process, who knows? And so there's nothing better than just actually having uh, the code available for this. Uh, the tricky thing, the caveat on this that applies to model DB, that applies to anything else that you might 
go out there and um, try to reuse somebody else's resources. The fact of the matter is other people have other priorities than what you have, right? So they might be solving a different problem than you, right? Hopefully they are, otherwise, why are you doing it? Um, so maybe the species is different. Maybe the temperature is different. Maybe the age is different. And, and of course, you know, they, they may have made mistakes. Um, so how do you decide this? How do you know if you can trust it? How do you know if you can reuse it, if it's applicable to your question? Well, there's nothing better to do than to go back and read the associated paper, right? Go look, compare the model and uh, the results to other similar models. Don't just look at one that gives a specific uh, result that you're interested in. We have tools both within Neuron and within ModelDB for exploring the model structure to help you uh, identify, oh, well, this is how the eight currents are distributed. I believe that, or I don't believe that. Um, you can check the ion channels individually, and obviously, whenever in doubt, um, try to work with an experimentalist if you're not one, so that somebody's out there that can give you any sort of context that you may not have. Um, so let's go. So here we are. So here is model DB. You can get there by modeldb.yale.edu. Takes you to this page. It's a nice landing page. We have um, a lot of information there. Uh, we do tweet out. Uh, model DB does tweet out uh, anytime that a new publication is added to model DB. So if you're interested in trying to keep track of uh, just what's happening within computational neuroscience literature. Um, this is a great place to go and do this. Uh, just to chime in on Ted's, suggest, uh, Ted's comment with regards to reusing code. Uh, yes, generally speaking, whenever you're pulling from a resource, you, uh, the typical custom is to cite the, uh, the model authors, the original people. So like for ModelDB, it's a model author for, um, neuromorpho.org, it's whatever paper had the morphology, and then the uh, resource that uh, you also say, and I got this from model DB, and then here's a citation for model DB reference paper. And all of this information uh, for model DB, this uh, how to cite model DB and suggested examples. But in any case, so what do you find when you go here? Well, you could browse by model name, but there is obviously uh, quite a list of models. Um, so in lieu of that, maybe you want to look for models that capture a given cell type. Um, so if you, you can click on cell type and look at uh, the list of model cell types or not. Um, that's, that's the problem with trying to do a live demo. Uh, you can look at different model concepts. Uh, so if you're looking for things, we've got things grouped together. What has to do with activity patterns? Well, there's bursting, oscillations. Uh, tempo pattern generation. We have all of these things uh, organized here. You can look for different uh, things. Uh, you can look for different pieces of metadata to describe your model. You can um, search for something. So let's say, let's say just down at the bottom, let's say that I'm looking for a disease thing. I'm looking for Alzheimer's. And so I can find, for example, uh, they, um, I can find, for example, that there are 14 different Alzheimer's models that are available in model DB. I can click on one of them. Here we are. Um, so this is what an individual model entry looks like in model DB. We've got a brief description, a link to the uh, references, and then all the various metadata annotations. So this is a Alzheimer's model that was looking at a hippocampus CA1 pyramidal glutamatergic cell. It has certain ion channels that are associated with it. It was done in neuron um, and uh, various other things that we might wanna know. We can look, so this gives us a high level overview of the thing. If I wanna download it, I can just hit download zip file. I can uh, look at this in the context of the modeling literature. Obviously, if you want to study um, if you want to study things in the context of the entire scientific literature, you turn to PubMed or Google Scholar or someplace like that, uh, Web of Science. Um, but within the context of the modeling literature, we try to keep track of any time that a mo computational model cites uh, a given paper. So I can see that there are these various models. Uh, so the model of uh, Kumon and Mayori 2012 uh, is, cites this particular paper. So I can see how the different computational modeling literature goes together. 
we can look at graphical representations of the cell structure under the model views tag. Uh, so here it is. This is a model of a CA1 pyramidal cell. This is what their CA1 pyramidal cell looks like. You can mouse over it to get a sense of the distribution of ion channels. You can also click into this um, and explore uh, very briefly. So here's, for example, the distribution of A-type potassium conductances within the cell. Um, and you see here, for example, that the, uh, the modelers for this uh, paper, which, in, which includes uh, Ted, uh, the modelers for this paper uh, chose a non-uniform value of A currents distributed across this paper, across this cell. If you're interested in why, check out the paper. Um, and then you can decide if you believe that or you don't believe this. But this gives you, a, if you think that's important, this is a thing that you really want to know to make sure that the models that you want to use have all of this. And you'll notice we've learned some things about the cell. We know what the cell looks like. We know how the channels are distributed. Um, we know what temperature this, the model was run at. It's run at 35 degrees Celsius. This, by the way, is not neurons default. Neurons default is for squid because that was what Hotch and Huxley looked at. They like it cold. Um, so we know that the modelers here thought about temperature. And in fact, if I click into this, I see that there's 10 different mod file mechanisms that were uh, potentially temperature dependent. And then finally, just in terms of the overview of model DP, we can go in and click, of course, on the individual files. Um, so here we are. There's a readme description typically for files. I can then go and look at, let's see. Oh, here is a calcium activated potassium channel. Um, and so here again, this is all described using mod files. We see just derivatives, we see functions, and you can get a reasonable sense out of what all of this means, even if you're not comfortable writing this yourself. This, by the way, is a tip that many people have found useful. Find something that's similar and see if you can use that as a launching point to modify it into whatever you need the dynamics to be, rather than uh, to just doing it from scratch. Um, so yeah, so this gives you a sense of what model DB is. I will point out that, uh, again, this is all in context of the scientific literature, modeling literature. So you'll notice that many of these files have a little asterisk next to them. If I click on this asterisk, it's going to point out that this particular calcium activated potassium channel, not calcium activated potassium channels in general, but this particular calcium activated channel has been used in a number of other uh, model entries in model DB. So I can give a sense as to what the community has thought of this particular channel. Well, it's been used in CA1 pyramidal cells. It's been used in CA3 pyramidal cells. So maybe those are, uh, if I trust those papers and I trust those authors, maybe those are places where I might want to use this model as well. If, uh, I, if I want to do Purkinje cells, I don't see a Purkinje cell model in here. Maybe this is not an appropriate play, uh, model to use within a Purkinje cell. So I can get some sort of a sense of context of all of that uh, just straight from the website. So how do we actually do anything once we've found a model? So let me not use this one. Let me pick a different one. So here's a model, classic model of Manin and Sanowski from 1996. I can just go ahead and download that file. Um, it's downloaded off screen because that's how this works. Um, so let me, for the moment, stop that and just go. And uh, I'm in my download folder. And now I can blah, blah, blah. I can, I now have a cells folder just because I have a cells folder, by the way, because when I look into this, uh, the file was called cells. So here I am, I can look at the files that I have within my cells folder. Um, sure enough, I have a bunch of mod files. I have a uh, Hoke, which is another programming language in addition to Python that Neuron supports. Um, and here we are. So I have this model. This is all the code for the main and Sanowski model. What can I do with it? First things first, I wanna run the model. I need to compile my mod files. No matter what platform I'm on, Windows, Linux, Mac, I'm always perfectly happy typing in or in IV modal. Other platforms, you may have other options, but in or in IV modal will always work. So there we go. 
I have compiled it. Um, so in theory, everything's ready to go. You'll notice that I didn't get any nasty red error messages. Um, so I can launch Neuron, many ways that I can launch Neuron, but I like to do everything from Python. So I'll just type Python uh, from Neuron import H and GUI. And then there we go. I have the Neuron main menu has appeared. Now that the Neuron main menu has appeared, uh, well, I will now load my file. There are, you'd have to look around, you'd have to read the readme to see how you're actually supposed to load the file. Uh, but I happen to know uh, for the sake of this one that the main file, the launching file, is a thing called mosinet.hoc. So this is a weird name, but you'll find that a lot of historical models um, use this name just as a convention for reasons um, to, to, uh, as the entry point for their model. So if you ever see a mosinet.oak or a mosinet.py, it's almost certainly uh, the main la launching point for the model. So I wanna load my model. So load file mosinet.oak. Um, I could have done this through the GUI, but I didn't. Um, just because I didn't think of it, to be honest. So it pops up a nice little dialogue. Uh, this ties into a conversation that we had in the chat a little bit. You can use, um, Neuron provides this interface to allow you to specify uh, whatever windows, whatever pattern. So I want this graph and this graph in the same windows, they move together. Okay, you can do that with a few lines of uh, Python code. So here they put a couple of buttons together. Okay, so I'll say that I want to run the figure one demo. And one of the things that they looked at was the effect of different morphologies. So let's say that I have a layer three pyramidal cell. So I just click on the layer three pyramidal cell and I can, let's say, uh, zoom in out and uh, zoom out. So this is the cell. Um, if I wanted, I could rotate it. I could explore it in, uh, in other ways, but this is the cell morphology. If I hit and then run, I see that it's generating uh, some short bursts. Um, and I did all of this and I could look at a different cell morphology because, you know, so here's a layer five uh, pyramidal neuron. Again, we can zoom out on this guy, um, move it around and so forth. So this is a different cell. And if I run this particular cell, then this generates uh, bursts that have more spikes. And that meant something to them in the context of the paper. You can go back and explore what it means. But now you can imagine that you can look at this, you have the code, you can modify it, you can do your own experiments on it, and you can build on it. Um, just to show you one other thing, uh, just because we won't otherwise, uh, I showed you model view within model DB. Neuron also has a tool called model view. You get there from tools model view. And it has a very similar interface and you can click in and explore uh, different distributions of channels and what's where uh, within the cell that you have. So I know I threw a lot of stuff at you, um, but importantly, we explored model DB and we looked at downloading a model and running a model. Uh, does anybody have any other questions on any of that? All right, if not, let's go back to uh, the slides. Oh, uh, if yeah. you do publish something that used files that you got from ModelDB, please be sure to cite the authors of the uh, work that, uh, that uh, uh, made that code available. And also please be sure to cite ModelDB. And if you ever forget how to do that, it's linked on the bottom of the page on model, every page on ModelDB, how to cite ModelDB. Should be flashing in red with dancing chipmunks. Um, well, maybe not. I'll, uh, I'll add that as a GitHub issue. Okay. Um, all right, so going back to our slides, uh, let's see. Oh, I guess one other thing while I'm here, just to point out, you too can share your model on MileDB, and I hope you do. Uh, whenever you're ready to do so, you can just go to MileDB's homepage and hit the big giant blue button, submit model, can't miss it. 
and you don't actually need a whole lot of information. The only thing that you strictly need is what's your code, can't share code without code, um, who you are so we can get in touch with you. And when you're ready to make it public, we need to know the citations. Uh, we do, however, provide a tool uh, that I strongly encourage you to use um, for suggesting metadata. Uh, so in particular, if I have, um, if I have a abstract, so I've written a paper, right? All of these things, the presumption is that there's a paper. So I've written a paper and I have some abstract and that kind of describes my model. I don't want to go through all the effort of click. Maybe I don't want to go through all the effort of clicking and figuring out, well, okay, what did they call it? What's the standard terms? Um, so let me just sort of go ahead and hit that big blue button. Let us find MileDB keywords for you. And I'll just paste in my abstract. Not my abstract, it's actually Ted's abstract, but you get the idea. Um, and then it's gonna come back and it's going to suggest, hey, based on your abstract, it looks like we should annotate the following pieces of metadata. It, does your model involve calcium dynamics? Does it involve A currents? Does it involve dendritic action potentials? And in, it so happens in this case, every single one of these pieces of metadata does in fact describe that model from Ted's paper. But if it didn't, I could just unselect one of them before accepting the ones that remain selected. And just like that, it populates some structured metadata fields. Why do we do this? We tag things so that other people can find your code. Why do you want other people to be able to find your code? Then they'll build on it. They'll, as Ted pointed out, they'll cite you. Um, this is a good thing. And uh, this, this makes sure that science continues progressing. And when it comes to promotions and tenure decisions, which many of you may be facing, or if you're not, uh, if you stay in the field, you probably will at some point, the tenure and promotions committee is not going to be asking your buddies on the campus where you are. They'll be sending out requests to people um, outside your university and maybe people you don't even know. And if you've been sharing your code regularly and, and people have been reusing it, and it's been influencing their thoughts and they've been able to, to advance their work because they can learn from what you've done, you're more likely to get good recommendations. Fair enough. So um, we are also, as a side note, ModelDB is in the process of updating uh, the website um to be more mobile friendly to integrate model view and to really sort of encourage more meta analysis across the modeling literature um so you can see where things are at by modeldb.science it is my perpetual hope that this is coming soon so hopefully this will be up soon um, if you do have feedback for you if you've used model db before or you've gone here and you found things that you like or things that you don't like I do invite you to fill out a survey on Model DB. The link is in the chat and also right here in the slides. Um, please do let us know how it's worked for you um, and what we can do to make it better. So thank you for that. Oh, one last comment about Model DB is <clears throat> even if you're looking in Model DB and you find somebody else's code, but it's not for Neuron, sometimes people writing in other languages, uh, people writing uh, with other programming for other simulation environments. Sometimes you can learn a lot from their code. You can find out the names of the, uh, excuse me, the values of the parameters that they use that weren't necessarily clearly stated in their paper. So it's, it, it can be helpful to examine source code that was done, say, even from, for MATLAB or just bare Python or anything else. So, very true. All right. So, if there's no other questions on this, moving on to the other resource that I want to highlight right now, uh, it's especially important for uh, neuron simulation, specifically because of neurons and uh, emphasis and support for morphologically detailed cells, neuromorpho.org. Um, neuromorpho.org is a, a repository of neuron reconstructions. Uh, this is important because it's extremely tedious and time consuming to uh, do all of the clicking that's done to um, zoom out and build, identify the shape of the cell, 
But there's no point doing a simulation that's morpholo includes a neuron morphology unless the morphology is realistic. So somebody has to go through the bother of actually making that reconstruction. And fortunately for you, uh, many, many other people have, and moreover, they shared their model, their morphologies that they've reconstructed on neuromorpho.org. So they have um, over 181,000 reconstructions from a thousand different cell types uh, spanning 400 brain regions. Um, again, so same sort of caveats apply for neuromorpho as apply for uh, model DB. Not everything exists in your context, right? When you're using morphologies that you didn't reconstruct yourself, um, you know, keep in mind that they may have not needed it, right? Maybe they uh, only, maybe they didn't care about the 3D shape. They only cared about a 2D projection or they stained it in a way that got them the data that they needed, but it doesn't capture the whole cell or the cell got amputated or there's all kinds of sort of experimental artifacts that could shape the quality of the data and the applicability of it for simulations, right? One way of doing this, again, same thing with model DB. If you find something that's uh, useful and you're gonna cite it, right? And neuromorpho. Uh, if you find something that's useful, be sure to read the paper, right? Why did they make this? Were they studying some disease? Because maybe that disease led to a different shape of the morphology. And if you're trying to study a healthy cell, well, then that's not gonna work. Um, some things that you can try to do, uh, you know, run your tests, look for, don't just plug a mo morphology that you found on the internet into a simulation without actually looking at it, right? Look to make sure, because sometimes they're disconnected or barely connected sections. And you can do this by inserting a passive conductance, lower the actual resistivity and leak conductance, and then just sort of injecting a huge ton of current into the soma. If there's no pinch points, no places where current has difficulty flowing, then you'd expect the membrane potential to rise almost uniformly everywhere. Um, another thing that's relatively common, especially in older models, is what's known as z-axis drift and backlash. Um, this is even, so basically literally, oh, it looks beautiful from this side, but then I rotate the cell, and then I see that for whatever reason, uh, the, z, the z values are just horribly off. That's easy. You know how you look for it? You rotate the cell and you see uh, if, that's, if that's going. Um, you should uh, check the diameters, right? Are the diameters constant or do they vary? Sometimes you'll find morphologies where somebody didn't care about the diameters. Maybe they cared about the branching structure of the cells. Perfectly legitimate study to do, but not so useful if you're saying that morphology matters. So check the diameters, do they vary? Um, maybe make a histogram, uh, look at that. So let's go and actually, let's go to neuromorpho.org. I have one conveniently handled uh, link here. It's tinymorpho, ti sorry, it's tinyurl.com slash neuromorpho C91662. Here we are. I will put that link in the chat as well so that you can play along at home. So here we are in neuromorpho.org. We found a particular morphology that's of interest to us. Um, we can see that they also have a ton of metadata. Uh, key amongst this, of course, is the paper uh, wherein the morphology came from that would tell us if there's, well, you know, so I can tell from looking at the, at the paper title alone that this cell came from a rat. If I'm not studying a rat, maybe I don't want to use this cell. So I have some various metrics that have been analyzed on the cell. Um, I have more follow, uh, met metadata. So this cell came between days 33 and 57. Um, it was, you know, stained using Lucifer yellow and so forth. Um, I can go and every neuro, every entry in neuromorpho has uh, two different representations of the morphology. First is whatever the, uh, the paper author provided. And so in this particular cell, uh, we get this data, um, which I'm not going to explain, but this is what's known as a eutectic uh, data format. 
And so what neuromorpho has done in order to make everything comparable, they have standardized all of the morphologies. And there are pros and cons to standardizing, but it does at least um, give a consistent format. So here we are, I can click on a standardized morphology and it looks something like this. This is what's known as an SWC file. Uh, fundamentally, the, the line starting with a pound, just like in Python, are comments. Um, and then fundamentally in each line, I have a point identifier, a type. So one indicates soma, um, an X, a Y, a Z. This is a diameter, I think, or maybe a radius, I never remember, and the parent point. So this is supposedly what makes this cell. Well, let's find out. Let's actually do it. So let's take that morphology file and I will download this file and I will store it. Um, I will store it in my downloads file folder. C91662.swc is what I called it. So let's try it. Let's see what happens. So here we are back in my terminal. Um, and I am going to go back up to my downloads folder just because that's where I was running. Uh, and I will launch Python to get to neuron. Again, don't have to do it this way, but I think it's good practice. Neuron import h comma GUI. All right, so once again, my uh, neuron main menu has appeared. I can go to file. No, just kidding. I can go to tools, uh, miscellaneous, import 3D. That's how I import a 3D shape. Uh, and then I can say that I want to choose a file. So I'll just click this little button. And over here, then I get a prompt to select a file. And I have a ton of stuff in my, um, in my uh, thing. So I will just make my life easier and I'll filter for just the SWC files, uh, which are still numerous. C91662.swc. I don't want to find it. Wait, why is it not there? Give me one second. All star SWC. Okay, I didn't save it where I thought I saved it. That's why it's not there. Let's try this again, shall we? This is the problem with uh, trying to do things live. Download linked file as. Okay, it's in my downloads folder, C91662. Now I gave it an extra thing. So let's try this again. You see this too, right? Why is it not there? Let's try this one last time. Download linked file. There we go. What? I literally see it right there. Oh, because it put it. Thank you. All right, so it ended up putting a text extension at the end of it. So I will move c91662.swc.txt to just be c91662.swc. Um, that was an annoying thing that happened when I downloaded from Neuromorpho. So now you know to look for it. Um, and thank you to the person on uh, chat who figured it out before I did. All right, so fundamentally, here we are. We now have this file. Uh, so let's go back to Neuron. I will um, try it again now. Let's see. So now, c91662.swc, there it is. We successfully imported it. Uh, well, we haven't actually imported it. If I did, I, if I were to try and make a shape plot within Neuron right now, I actually wouldn't see anything. Um, so what I can do, however, so I'm looking at, this shows all the points, I can toggle that on and off, I can show the diameters, I can rotate this around, I can do all that sort of thing. Um, what I can do, there's two things that I can do, I can either instantiate it directly, uh, which I'll go ahead and do. So now in Neuron, I have instantiated this cell. So now if I go and go graph shape plot, sure enough, there's my cell. And I can um, click that box and hit 3D rotate. 
and I can spin the cell around. And as I do so, you'll see that uh, there's no crazy z-axis error. So that's a good sign. I'm not jumping all around. Um, you'd know it if it was happening. Um, and so forth. The other thing, the last thing that I want to point out with on this, um, I can also, instead of instantiating it, I can export it to what's known as a cell builder. And we also had this sort of a chat on, um, on the uh, chat as well. Um, you see a very stylized representation of the topology. Don't worry, it hasn't lost the shape. Uh, but in any case, I can use this to declare biophysics, ion channels that are expressed in various places. Maybe I put on everywhere, there's a Hodgkin-Huxley channel, let's say. And um, once I've done this, I can go to management and I can uh, declare a cell type and I give it a name, okay? And then I'm done with that. I can export this to a file. And um, well, I can save it fundamentally. And then I can load that back in Python and create a whole bunch of these cells, all with whatever biophysics and shape uh, that I've loaded. Does that make sense? All right. And uh, just for the record, of course, you can also, everything you can do through the graphical interface, you can do through Python. Uh, so just for the record, this is how you would load a uh, SWC file um, through Python. And you can either instantiate it at the top level, which is what's done here, or instantiate inside of an object. And that will um, allow you to make classes that have shapes. Uh, and then you can plot it either using neurons interviews graphics, the way that we've shown, or this is how you do a shape plot inside of Plotly. If you like Python's graphical interface, graphical libraries as well, you can do Plotly, Matplotlib, uh, what have you. And we'll see some of that later on today. Um, and with that, uh, I think that's all I wanted to say about uh, ModelDB and uh, neuromorpho.org, unless anybody has any other questions. Um, there's a question is, um, there's a question that I think I'll answer on the chat. Um, just cause I want, I need to think about it. It's a little tangential. Yeah, um, the, <clears throat> the question really depends on what do you mean by by myelinated axon um and i mean do you do you need it to be myelinated between branch points or do you need to have myelin pieces at regular or, or irregular intervals the general answer is <clears throat> probably the latter because real axons can often have long runs that are not branched and yet, if you were to stain for the myelin and look at it, you would see many, many nodes of Ranvier along the unbranched section. What you need to do in that case is to break the unbranched thing into sections, um, myelinated sections alternating with nodes of Ranvier. And that becomes a, a process um, of, of manual editing of the uh, morphometric data. And it's uh, more complicated. You need you need either actual uh, actual uh, information about how long the myelinated parts are, or you need to um, make a a good guess based on fiber diameter. So. All right. So Ted, do you want to take it up on networks? Okay, <clears throat> uh, let me see here. Let me go back to sharing my screen, desktop, and 